the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the future of the book and the books of the future, a call to duty sailing the sea without a shore, running for Congress in a way that never goes out of fashion, plus part 44 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We took the podcast on the road this time, and for the first time we made a remote show at a science fiction convention. This one worked out pretty well, and we may do more sooner or later. The convention was a Logicon in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina here in the U.S. The topic was the future of the book. And we had a great panel to talk this over with. They included Mark L. Van Name, creator of the John and Lobo science fiction adventure series, John Kessel, two times Nebula winner for his short stories, English professor, and he's also the head of the creative writing program at North Carolina State University. Incidentally, when you're in the mood for some short stories, Bain has brought together almost every John Kessel story in a great ebook called The Collected Kessel. John provides introductions to each of his stories there, and you can find that over at BainEbooks.com. And for what's in there, I think it's a bargain. Also in on the discussion was Bain's own slushmaster general, Gray Reinhardt. Gray is also the author of numerous short stories that have appeared in Analog and Asimov's science fiction magazines. He's the guy who will be the first reader and the first arbiter on an unsolicited manuscript submission to Bain books, too. By the way, that's the job I started with at Bain back in the long ago before time. Finally, we have Bain editor Jim Menz on the panel. Jim's been an editor at Tor and Del Rey, and he knows his science fiction. Also, Bain editorial assistant Christopher Cifani chimed in. He helped me set up the equipment as well. So it's a great roundtable on where the book is headed in the future, if it's headed anywhere, that is. First, though, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Hey, the January eARCs are out. Now, an eARC is an extremely advanced new supercomputer prototype available in tablet computer size. This thing is amazing. It's about 8.5 by 11 inches and thin as a razor. You can fold it, crunch it, roll it without affecting the display significantly. There's a specialized stylus with a liquefied chemical that allows you to write directly on the computer. And the markings are displayed for years at a time. No electronics whatsoever. The thing operates entirely via the nuclear strong force and chemical bonds. You know, what you're describing sounds suspiciously like a piece of paper and a pen. And anyway, that's not what an e-arc is at all. No? Okay, fine. What is an e-arc, Laura? An eARC is an electronic advanced reader's copy. These are the manuscripts pretty much raw as we get them from the author's hands, and we make them available to you several months before the book is actually in print. Hey, the new eARCs are great. First, there is the new novel in David Drake's RCN series. That's the one that features Captain Daniel Leary and Adele Mundy, the spy who works for the Republic of Cinnabar. That's right. Uh, This time they're saddled taking care of a spoiled brat with political connections, and they head into an area infested with pirate types. There's lots of action, and Dave Drake's usual wry and dry take on the world. And we've got a real treat this time as well. Want to tell us about that one, Laura? Sure thing. This one is A Call to Duty by David Weber and Timothy Zahn. We have this one available as an e-arc a good seven months before publication. Yeah, so lots of time to check that out. It's a new series in the Honorverse, set in the early days of the Manticoran Star Empire. The hero is Travis Long, who starts out as an ensign in the very early days of the Royal Manticoran Navy. Fun stuff, sounds like, and that's not going to be out until um, October. Right. Well, if you're a David Weber and Honor Harrington fan, here's the absolute latest entry. You can't get much fresher than that. What's it called again? 
It's called A Call to Duty, the E-Arc. Excellent. These are only available one place, these E-Arcs, and that's BainEbooks.com. Also, if you're on a mobile device, we got the mobile site in beta. You can find that at BainEbooks.com forward slash mobile, M-O-B-I-L-E. And also, we get this question fairly regularly. Can I buy a book at BainEbooks.com and read it on my Kindle? And the answer to that is absolutely. So I'd like to remind everyone who has a Kindle that there's no problem reading a Bain ebook that you purchased at BainEbooks.com on your Kindle. Yeah, it's easy to do. We tell you how on the website. And remember, Bain ebooks are always encryption free and downloadable as many times and in as many formats as you can find anywhere else in the universe. Always have been, always will be. You can purchase The Sea Without a Shore and a Call to Duty eARCs and hundreds of other great titles in either place. Download them and start reading. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour Remote Edition. We are at the January 2014 Illogicon in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina. This is a nice smaller convention that draws a really cool crowd. We have some of them with us, um, and these include Mark Van Name, John Kessel, Gray Reinhardt, uh, and Jim Mintz. Hello, guys, folks. Mark L. Van Name is a Bain author and longtime Bain Books friend and consultant. He's the creator of the John and Lobo science fiction adventure series with John Moore, a tough customer who gets called in for special operations when the chips are down and mere brute force won't solve the problem. And Lobo, John's loyal friend and colleague who is also an artificially intelligent spacecraft and battle platform. Mark's latest entry in that series is No Going Back. Mark is also the editor of a couple of Bain anthologies, Transhuman, with the TFK Weisskopf, who you may have heard of, and Contemporary Dark Fantasy Anthology, The Wild Side. And John Kessel. John is a multiple Nebula and James Tiptree Jr. award-winning science fiction writer who's the author of numerous short stories and two novels, Good News from Outer Space and Corrupting Dr. Nice. John is also a professor of English at North Carolina State University, where he leads the creative writing program. John is also a noted science fiction and fantasy anthologist and critic. Pretty much the complete short stories of John Kessel are collected in a wonderful Bain ebook edition, The Collected Kessel, available at BainEbooks.com and elsewhere. Uh, Gray, oh, Gray's here, yes. Gray Reinhardt is the author of short stories that have appeared in Analog, Asimov's, and elsewhere. His latest is What is a Warrior Without His Wounds, which appeared in Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine last year. Gray is also a noted filker. And his album, Truth and Lies and Make-Believe, is recently out. We've had a couple of cuts from that here on the podcast before. Gray is also the slush editor at Bain Books. Finally, Jim Menz is senior editor at Bain Books, where he works with Bain writers such as David Weber, John Ringo, Eric Flint, Larry Correa, Mark L. Van Name, and many others. He's had a checkered past at many top publishers, such as Tor and Del Rey. Jim is also a subsidiary rights director at Bain, handling foreign sales, movie and television rights, and lots of other areas. Jim doesn't want anyone to know it, but he's also from Wisconsin. So, um, I thought we could talk about the future of books today. Always a good topic among us reading and writing folk. Uh, are we doomed? Are we on the verge of a new paradigm? Uh, or is everything going to go pretty much the same? Mark, let me start with you. Uh, as well as being an SF author, you run a successful IT company, and maybe by accident at first, part of what your people handle is the making and distribution of ebooks, particularly Bain ebooks. How does the ebook revolution look from the inside, or is it a revolution? From the perspective of what the delivery mechanism is, I think it is a revolution in that we are now taking stories of all types. Uh, but certainly novels, which are the, the bulk of where the money is, and we're delivering them in a new way. So instead of going down to a place or ordering from an, a different place paper, you're now ordering electrons, and the electrons are flowing into devices of your choice um, or device of your choice. But in terms of what people are buying, having seen the sales figures for both print and ebooks, it isn't really – 
changing dramatically. There, at the tail end, there are occasionally people who will self-publish and have great success stories, but really that's a tiny, tiny, tiny minority. The vast majority of the self-published stuff as it always has, doesn't make much money. If you look at the authors who are popular in print, they're the same order in the same rough percentages as they were in in, in ebooks. So if you sell a lot in print, you're probably going to sell a lot in ebook. And uh, there are, I think, some potential revolutions over the short term in terms of impulse buys, in the same way that for a while a paperback could be an impulse buy until costs went up of paperbacks uh ebooks priced right can be impulse buys but fundamentally people are just finding another way to deliver stories and in that sense it's not a revolution we have found throughout the history of humanity ways to deliver stories we had oral stories we had stories drawn on cave walls we had you know papyrus we had books we find ways to tell stories because i think stories are essential to humans and this ebook revolution is just another way to deliver stories that's a separate question from whether uh, the physical book is in danger and i do think that the physical book long term is likely to be something that becomes more the province of book fetishists like me than of mass people. But I think that's going to take a long time. I, when I buy an ebook, which I do sometimes on long trips, so I don't have to care, take the weight, I always buy the paper book because I'm one of those people that really likes having paper books. I find them more comforting, more pleasant to read than any reader, and I have every major reader accessible to me at my company. But... Uh, I don't think books are going to go away for a very long time. I think there are going to be plenty of people who like them. I do think that ebook sales will ultimately be bigger, though. Is the um, so you don't think the technology is changing the way that that books uh, that books are? Yeah, I I I think the only change that I would like to believe will happen in in terms of the way books are is that it will maybe be a bit of a renaissance for short stories in the sense that you don't know as obviously the length of what you're buying uh, online, you know, unless the writers go out of their way to tell you. And short stories have always, not always, uh, in for a long time in publishing, short stories have been the low money end of it and the low audience end of it. The, the SF magazines have very small readerships now. Anthologies very rarely sell anywhere near as well as the single author works of their leading contributors, even though you get lots of authors in one place. And I've always thought that was sad. I, I love anthologies. Uh, John and I here, here in this podcast did an anthology I adore uh, called Intersections, the Sycamore Hill Anthology. And I remember when we finished the hardback run and John got the royalty statement and we looked at it together excitedly. And I remember this exact number. This is an exact number. We had sold 882 copies in hardback worldwide. And that wasn't just U.S. That was all the tour sales, 882 copies of a book that had an incredible array of writers. I thought uniformly good stories, a Hugo winning story in it by uh, Bruce Sterling. But it, I mean, we had, I don't know, nine major award winners in this book, 882 copies. None of the people there have a single novel that sold as badly as that. Uh, nobody in the book did. And uh, as you know, if you sold that many copies in a, your first novel, you might not get to sell a second novel. So I, I'm hoping that, that short stories might come back at least somewhat. But I, I don't think it's going to change the nature of books. People like long, engaging works, and, and novels are long and engaging works, at least done well. Well, John, let me ask you something along the same lines. Um, you defend the great tradition of literature as a university professor, and yet what you usually write is science fiction. You might be in the best position of anybody to answer the question, what is a book really? And uh, are we on the verge of a change in what a book is, perhaps? Well, I think um, following up on what Mark said, that um, that the basic nature of a book is it's a, a fictional narrative uh, coded in written language, okay, in, in its, its simplest terms, uh, if we're talking about fiction. And... Uh, you know, there are stories that have been told in many, many forms for a long, long time, and, and the book has been around 
the fictional book, the novel, and the short story. And the short story goes back to the early 1800s. The novel goes back maybe another 100 years to the early 1700s, and, and that's it. And so, uh, in a way, if you think about these historically, the, the age of the book is, uh, is relatively short. Uh, and and uh, it may be that this mass medium uh, will will pass. Uh, you know, uh, historically, who knows in another hundred or two hundred years. But I, I have to say that, uh, as Mark said, that uh, it seems to me that at least the idea of a, a written uh, you know prose narrative uh, is a, is is a very a flexible form. It's very uh, been proved its popularity in a lot of different formats over a long time. It seems to me that it has some real durability to it. Uh, I think the short story may not. Well, let's say it's hard to see from where we are right now. You know how it is when you're looking at a historical thing. When you're in just the place where you are, it's hard to, to get a good perspective on it. Certainly in in science fiction, short stories. Uh, you know there used to be. 50 pulp magazines publishing science fiction short stories, and now there are five, okay? And then now there are online magazines. So there are quite a few short stories being written and published, if you want to use e-publishing as, as part of it. But, uh, you know, it does seem to me that the audience attention goes to longer narratives, to novels. And um, some people suggested that short stories are going the way of lyric poetry. That, that, you know, lyric poetry used to be read by ordinary people back in the 1700s, 1800s. And, why couldn't that be, Jeff? <laughs> well, why? why? Well, I don't know if I'm very good at coming up with, with reasons why. Uh, um, it, maybe it has something to do with the whole idea of the art story where, the, the, you know, the contemporary literary story tends to be real subtle and, and, and not dramatic, not overly dramatic, and, and uh, maybe that's – that's caused readership to move to more more dramatic forms. Um, I don't know. I really it's hard for me to say. Um, it does seem to me that that the novel is going to hang around. Uh, uh, probably most novels will be published as ebooks. I think it'd be nice if if the short story had a renaissance. Uh, I do think there are a lot of short stories being written still, uh, but there's not much money in it. It seems. But I, I also feel that the the paper book will persist longer than I think some people uh, believe. I think they're going to hang in there quite a while, even after maybe commercially they're not that, that uh, uh, dominant a product. Um, you know, maybe they'll be like vinyl records are, <laughs> uh, that, that, that there are people who go out of their way to, to listen on vinyl and prefer it. Um, so it has a technological, it's a sturdy platform. The, the paper book, okay, whereas my, you know, my Kindle or my iPad is a relatively fragile device, and uh, uh, there's something to be said for that sturdiness. You know, 100 years from now, the paper books we have, it's hard to, like, destroy paper books, okay, uh, and even if you, even they mildew, they're, they're still hanging in there. Uh, you know, it's very easy for these technological devices to fall apart and if you just leave them on the desk for a month, uh, so... Um, so I don't know. I'm not. I'm not arguing against the ebook. Yeah, it's very easy to flip back and forth. As I mean, you're an inattentive reader like I am, I have to usually go back. What happened on the last page? You know, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, uh, I you know I'm hardly a prophet. And one thing you, you get about uh, lit professors in universities, we tend to be, you know, we know lots of old stuff. Okay, <laughs> and we may look forward a little bit, but we're not the best prognosticators. Well, Gray, you write short stories uh, at the moment. You're uh, you're heavily engaged in in making your uh, debut in short stories. Uh, you obviously think writing science fiction short stories is worthwhile. Um, do you think the short story form is making a comeback due to technology, or or is it still in decline? And you're just doing it to uh, to write a novel one day, or uh, or do you genuinely enjoy uh, that form? For the most part, my pursuit of short stories has to do with the fact that I don't have a long enough attention span right now to write novels. Um, or, I guess, to be a little less charitable to myself, I don't have the discipline to sit down and, and hammer out a novel, where I, whereas a short story I can, I can work on in smaller chunks over a, a decent period of time. I do think that a lot of folks are having some success in packaging their short stories as small ebooks 
at at small prices, ninety nine cents or something like that for a, a, a smaller story. Um, a number of my friends who have, have taken their stories they published in Analog or Asimov's and put a new cover on them and reprinted in themselves, reprinted being a, a euphemism for turned them into an EPUB. Um, and they don't sell necessarily a lot of them, but it's enough to, to keep their name out there for folks. Uh, so short stories have a longer life than they used to because, you know, when mine were coming out in Asimov's back in the 90s, they were gone after that month. Yeah, unless you could resell it uh, to a, a foreign magazine or unless you could, could get it placed into an anthology, uh, I, I agree. I have not tried to take any of my stories and repurpose them, if you will. Uh, but it's a, it's a tempting thing to try to do and see if I could get, I don't know, coffee money, uh, beer money. So Jim Men's publishing is changing rapidly um, within what with consolidation, a mass move to digital publications. Um, Publishers other than Bain seem to have gone from panic to some measure of acceptance and maybe even excitement about ebooks. Of course, Bain has been there all along. So, what's next? Mobile devices are proliferating. Uh, are we witnessing the ebook take the place of the mass market paperback, even as we speak commercially? Um, like, what's what's on the ground, boots on the ground books? What's going on? Or will there be print books at all in twenty years? Well, first, I got to say, you know, Mark and John are completely full of it. Ebooks are the complete and total paradigm shift. Publishers will soon be obsolete. Now writers can reach directly to their consumer audience and work the unnecessary evils being removed from the process. Oh, wait, I've been hearing that for 15 years, and that still hasn't happened yet. Like Mark said, um, what ebooks represent is another form of distribution to reach an audience. Publishers, of course, are excited at the notion, at least smart publishers are excited at the notion of being able to reach an audience in a way that's affordable and easy. In fact, that is, of course, what Jim Bain did when he started selling ebooks nigh on 15 years ago now almost, at a time when all the other publishers were running around screaming that the world is falling and it's all going to be a huge problem. Jim Bain said, hmm, wait, this is a way for me to get books cheap and easy to an audience? Wow, that's great. And it is indeed at that point where we are starting to reach, I wouldn't call it a paradigm shift, but obviously... Um, the erosion of the mass market paperback, and it, it both in terms of distribution and sales, and whether or not one is driving the other is a different topic entirely. Uh, but indeed, mass market sales are shrinking, and indeed, you are seeing a climb in ebook sales. And so you could look at those two. I don't know if it's quite so directly causally related, but they certainly are related. Um, and it is a way to reach an audience. Now, a smart publisher is going to find a way to do that. What publishers do is find quality fiction and try and reach an audience. And for those of you who have a hundred self-published books waiting in your to-read pile and you read them, um, you'll soon discover that you appreciate a publisher who actually brings professional editing, professional copy editing, proofreading, and the rest of the process. The more you go through what we consider the slush pile, the more you'll appreciate what publishers represent. And in terms, of course, of what the current market is, being a publisher who actually has that recognizable brand, being known for strong science fiction and fantasy with heroes you can root for, um, action-driven story, and that's the kind of thing that our audience co keeps coming back for, and we, we've done well by that. Um, also, in terms of what it means to the future of the book itself, I do think that, like Mark said, it's still going to be something that will be around, even for fetishists, uh, somewhere down the line. I don't think physical books are going to go away for quite some time. Uh, in terms of technology, what we're looking at is several paradigm shifts of the quality of the technology for ebooks, where indeed your mobile phone is a quality reader that's a very comfortable thing. We're all waiting for, you know, the ladies' primer from the Diamond Age from Neil Stevenson, where it folds up in your pocket, you open it up, it's a, it meets the three B's quite readily in a convenient way. Three B's being bed, beach, and bath. If you can get it there in a way that's convenient, readable, and, and you know, you don't have to worry about nodding off in the tub and losing your ebook reader. Um, then we'll really see a move away from physical books as the primary source, but we're still technologically short of that. Um, 
And yet, of course, it's not going to fundamentally change what a novel is. It's not going to fundamentally change what fiction is. Obviously, story has been with us since we were hunter-gatherers huddled around the campfire. And like John said, for several centuries now, it's been the printed word. I think the printed word, well, word that's readable, I guess we have to say, because if we move to ebooks, I guess it's not actually being printed per se, but I think that written word in whatever format it's being delivered is not going to go away. Um, I think the real shift will be whether or not there are other forms of entertainment that spawn out of publishing. And by that, I mean things like enhanced books. Uh, obviously, you're seeing people out there trying to, Big companies with tech trying to do things yeah, like wild guesses of, of what enhanced books might work. Or are there any? Um, there's some people who've done some interesting experiments. Whether they've actually made money for all the efforts of what they did to enhance their books, that's a completely different matter entirely. But the ability, I mean, you have it to be in. Enhanced books are being approached from two different levels. There's the ground up people who have technological background who also write, who are doing fun things with their own books. And those are far and away the more interesting artifacts. And then you've got places like Audible slash Amazon who are trying to sync up your reading book with your audio book so that it's a seamless experience for you. Um, I use that all the time now. Yeah. You do. You, you listen to it and then read from that point. That's great. I think that you're a bit of an outlier in that because I think listening to an audio book is a different experience than reading. Um, not in necessarily a bad way either or. There are different forms, different experience for the consumer. I certainly see where there'll be people who do that, but I don't think that'd be the majority. The ability to be able to insert video, music, all the rest is certainly technologically feasible even now, although something in a way that's easily deliverable over a mass distribution system, no, but that's probably coming at some point. Um, well, it's a question of really is bandwidth, size, and uniformity of format and cost, yeah. And we're not there yet, but there are big companies with big money who are looking at that. So it will come. But will that mean that's book business? Will that mean that's just something that's going to be tying into the entertainment dollar? Is it the same people that's going to compete with video games and movies and streaming TV and books? Yes, it's all part of the same pie. It's all part of that experience of how do you get people to spend their leisure time and money on your product. But it's not going to change printed word books. Uh, it's just going to create yet more crowded piece of the pie. And that'll be a little bit tougher for books to muscle in and, and find their place amongst people and get their attention. This Mark, the one point I would disagree with is I, I've had talks with Amazon's uh, executives and had under NDA the opportunity to look at um, sales figures. And I can tell you that the ebook revolution is leading to a great increase in book sales overall. It's not all going where it should be, and it's not clear if that's going to, in, in my opinion, and it's not clear if that's going to continue. But right now, total unit sales, books are actually in a resurgence, and that's important. Yeah, I definitely want to clarify. I totally agree with Mark. I was looking long-term in terms of where technology might take us 50, 60 years down the line. But absolutely, I mean, the great thing is that we are living at a time when literacy rates are at an all-time high. There are more readers. And, in fact, the ability to have backlist available. It's something that, you know, Bain, as a traditional publisher, has been smart and, indeed, I would argue, is still in existence because we are very strong about supporting our backlist. If we have an author who's writing new novels, we make darn sure the rest of the series is in print, even if some pencil pushing geek says, hey, you're only selling a 1,000 copies of that old backlist title. It's not worth it. We say, yes, it is, because the fans want the whole series. And that idea of having backlist available and being able to reach an audience and the fact that books can ebooks make it cheaper, so therefore, guess what? Why not? I'm going to spend 20 bucks on books, but now I'm going to buy five books. You get the, the higher amount of units, but it's also a question of the reader can experience the entire series and will and can devour them, buy them stockpile them you don't think nearly as much about gee i don't want to have to carry 20 books home but eh, you know what maybe i do want to get the rest of the series ebook it's just a push of a button and now i've got it so i absolutely i think that ebooks have represented a great opportunity obviously it's been something bain's been doing for a long time and the rest of the world's starting to catch up but in terms of taking that long term how will the book evolve and what will it mean technologically the enhanced book and how that overlaps and how that blends and will you get the experience for the feature film to the 
music can you get the soundtrack to the movie that was made of the book and listen to it while you're reading it and all that sort of stuff there'll be some interesting things that come out of it but it won't affect directly the printed word and how we do our business it'll just be enhanced to what we do yeah i'm not in the publishing industry this is john uh, and uh, but i I'm, I'm interested in this idea of the enhanced book it, it, I, maybe I am just an old dinosaur, but it seems to me that the experience of reading a, a, a book, you know, in, in in words, is is very different from those other things. And those things are valuable. I mean, if you have a soundtrack or if you have images, a video of some scene or something like that, I think that's 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 valuable. People want that, but I'm not sure that that's going to replace the book or or somehow invalidate the book. I, I, um, I remember I, I was a Nebula Awards uh, event probably 12 to 15 years ago, and uh, a man from the gaming industry was uh, uh, the keynote speaker, and he was talking about how he needed to get us all on board, that we were all behind the curve because we were still writing books. And what we needed to do was to get into game design because that was going to replace the book. Because uh, in the game design, the character, the uh, the viewer, the the um, uh, market, the market people are are they're they're experiencing it directly, and they can choose what happens. Okay, instead of being bound by what the author tells them, the characters do. They they go in there and they experience it themselves. And um, my feeling about that was that uh, you know the fact that you, the reader can't control it is not a, a, a bug but a feature uh and and uh, uh he wants to replace real life right and and in fact that that you know the the great the great books the great stories are great it seems to me because we read them not being able to control you know uh when uh when hamlet you know uh um uh, uh uh, ends up, you know, getting the poison sword, you know, uh, I guess a lot of readers would say, oh, you know, no, he doesn't get the poison sword. He gets the other sword, okay? But the, the power of the story comes from the fact that Shakespeare told us what happens, okay? Or Dickens told us what happens, and, and we can't change it. And, and if, you, if you were able to change it, uh, it seems to me it would, it would lose its power. Um, that's just uh, uh, my take on it. Of course, his living proof for that video game designer is, of course, that there were all those New York Times best-selling choose-your-own-adventure novels <laughs> from the 80s. Oh, wait. Yeah, this is great. The thing that occurred to me with that is that that experience is great for the, for the gamer, but it's an experience that is external, whereas the, the, so much of the experience of reading a book is internal in your own imagination where you create or bring to it something to make it a little bit different from necessarily what the author wrote or even intended. And to think that it would, we would be able to transition to something that was so completely external, that doesn't seem like it would ever supplant the book as an experience. Can I, let me jump in with one thing that, well, one thing I'd like to jump in with is that I've been, uh, I've been, I'm sort of a, a part of a brainstorming group with some people that I think are on the, on the cutting edge of, of ebooks, uh, out there. And we've been talking, we're not, when we talk about enhanced, nobody in that group thinks any, uh, you know, putting video in is going is a good idea or, but the kind of enhancements that we think might actually be in the cards are, analytics books that read you while you're reading them that um, are analyzing your habits and are helping you get a better reading experience out of it like they know how much you want to read um, they um, they tell you things about what you might want to read next uh, we don't know yet but we think that the that the fact that we can uh, we can really like down to the uh, down to the the word figure out where somebody stops where somebody starts um, we think that might be able to um, to to be translated into a, a better experience for the reader and make it even better to read. Uh, that's that's the idea that we're working on. And we don't know exactly how we're going to do that. But Yeah, this is Mark. Two comments uh, on that and then on what John said. Uh, on that, I actually think, personally think that's going to fail pretty hard. And the reason I think it's going to fail hard is that um, where that leads is to basically – the 
an automated process of story book creation. And I think that's going to fail because of what I think people buy books for. I don't believe uh, as much as the story arcs are important and the plots are really important. I, th I don't think that's at core what people buy books for because you pick a plot and you can walk into a bookstore and find 5,000 of, of that plot. Uh, basic structure. I think people read for the voice and viewpoint of the author. And so we read Shakespeare because of Shakespeare's brilliance at stories. We read each of our favorite authors because we like the way they tell the story and see the world. And the more we try and automate that or have the book help shape that, the more we formularize it, the more we pull out that element that I think is the lens we want. Don't you think it could enhance the individual voice, though, in some manner? Uh, I, I, by making it... Maybe, but I think that there, you're, you're messing with a careful thing. You know, could, to, to switch media for just a second, could we enhance the Mona Lisa? I am pretty sure we could say all the things that are wrong with it. Would that destroy it in the process? Could we take each of our favorite authors and help them uh, fix their weaker sentences and fix the flaws in their philosophical viewpoints and clean up this or that? Yeah, I think we could. And in the end, would the output be as good? I, I don't think so. I, I could be wrong and I could be deeply behind the times, but I think that the the, the people that we are as authors is part of what readers respond to. And our perspective, good or bad, is what they respond to, and they respond to that good or bad. And I think the more the product becomes homogenized and technologically cleaned up, the less interesting and it is and certainly the less enduring it is. And I would, I would apply that across all media um, from music through movies. Yeah, you can make a mass-produced movie with all soul wrung out of it, and you can promote the hell out of it and sell it once, but you don't tend to – it doesn't sustain, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have to agree with Mark on that. And indeed, I think that uh, especially in books – you know, whether it's brand for publisher or brand for author, it's the, if you if unless you have one book to write, um, the fact of the matter is trust in the author and coming back to visit the authors you like is probably one of the number one drivers for book sales. And on the other hand, what Tony was saying in terms of the analytics, I think there are some fascinating opportunities from the retail end of things where you could study that and use that as a way to ever improve the. You might also be interested in buying this recommendation and that actually be you know in a way that could create all sorts of sophisticated metadata screening that readers would and consumers would trust more and more and so from distribution and sales it's, there's a huge opportunity although technologically getting that all worked out would be a something for the NSA oops was that out loud I um I, I find myself, uh, you know, out of my depth here. So, uh, uh, you know, being a, a medieval thinker myself, uh, I just, you know, use my quill pen and my my candle as I work my way through the narrative. Uh, uh, it is interesting to me. It seems to me that uh, this sort of idea of, I guess, it's sort of like data mining the text as as someone reads it. Uh, I know that's an interesting idea, but it strikes me that not every reader is there for the same thing. I guess that, that, you know, you say if you, you could use it to individuate, just the way Netflix, for instance, will tell me, okay, if you like this movie, you know, you might want to watch this movie. Uh, so, so that, I think, is, is a, a very positive thing. But on the other hand, it, it does seem to me that... Um, well, what if you could use it to tell you, all right, you, you're on an airplane, you've got an hour, mm -hmm. and you, don't, you, you know you want to read something, but you don't know what. Um, and that thing could, um, you know, it, would, it knows you well enough that it could say, here's the perfect thing. You're like, oh, yeah. And you, you that ops of what to read next, um, hmm. which I've experienced all the time. See, but I don't, I don't want something that helps me become more like my last taste. I want things that challenge me. I want people, you know, I, I hate recommendation engines that are more of the, sorry, uh, this is Mark. I, I said, I, I don't want things that are going to funnel me toward the same i'm going to read some of the same but i want the friends who say have you ever tried this guy have you ever tried this woman have you have you thought about this i want to watch all kinds of movies i want to read all kinds of books i want to 
experience. I mean, sometimes I want comfort reading, but I don't want to be funneled toward one thing. I find recommendation engines, uh, maybe, maybe a lot of people do want to be funneled toward one thing, and maybe it could be commercially successful in that way. But I think that there, there's a danger in recommendation engines in, in that they do take us more and more down the same path, and they limit our worldview when, in fact, they should. we should be encouraging ourselves to broaden ourselves. Uh, I also think that often, at least the ones that exist, are, are kind of dunderheaded. Uh, and, well, the, you know, they say, okay, so this is a, a British movie that has a, a, a female character in it. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> uh, so, you you know, you're getting something that has nothing to do with why you read that for, first uh, a book in, in the first place. You know, they don't really understand. All they're getting is the exterior vision of your eyes going over the words. They're not really inside of your subjectivity and, and what, why, why, what it is about that book that really, really knocks you out. And to that, I would think that there might be real value in developing one of these recommendation engines that would be more interactive with you in terms of what are the kinds of things you're looking for? What are the kinds of things that, you, that interest you beyond this small subset of purchases you have just made? I want, uh, I want to second what Mark said that, you know, often some the most amazing experience I've, I've had with books or films is when I've seen something I did not, I never would have gone to see it. I walked into the theater by accident. Someone left the book, you know, sitting on my desk and, and uh, you know, I, I, I would never have picked it up. And, and uh, it's kind of unfortunate if, if you're guided only to the things you're familiar with. Some of the worst experiences. Yes. <laughs> well, that's that true, too. That's true. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that the technology has led us back to the age-old question, you know, do you write for the, you know, literary intellectual stimulation or do you write for the broad mass commercial? I mean, this isn't quite that simple, but in some ways it is that sen essential question. And commercially speaking, obviously, there's been plenty of people who made their money going for the McDonald's effect, more of the same. It's the 12-volume epic heroic fantasy series that's delivering the same thing, and the, and the reader's comfortable with that. doesn't mean that the reader doesn't also want to go ahead and try something new. It kind of depends on their mood. And I have to admit, the more I think about what Tony was saying in terms of the technology, and also with Gray, what are we talking about here? Uh, maybe facial recognition software that this computer's smart enough to actually recognize the stuff that really does excite you, can read, it, read your reactions and stuff, and actually become that sophisticated sure. that it would be. And uh, then we're entering a whole new ball game, and that is not that far away from being technologically feasible. Although the investment in terms of capital to make that work, and you know, I don't know, violating the secrecy or just uh, getting people to agree to let you uh, have the computer watching you all the time on your webcam, just only for personal use of making recommendations for you. Uh, this day and age, uh, generationally, I think that there's a, certainly plenty of people out there who. Don't worry that much about their own privacy and secrecy and that kind of issue and, and would be comfortable with the idea of, hey, you know what, let the computer watch me because it's going to make better recommendations for me. The Xbox One's already running into that. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Christopher. Uh, I work in the mailroom at Bain, um, and I help set up some of the technical stuff. Ran out, ran a mic, grabbed a mic stand. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, a little bit of editorial assistant work. Uh, and... Um, I, I find a lot of this interesting. I was just saying that uh, pertinent to that particular um, problem, uh, the Xbox One is currently undergoing that upheaval right now in terms of public outcry and people discussing uh, the idea of the machine watching you all the time because that is a feature, so to speak. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about in this discussion is um, sort of new media frontiers and online communities that uh, I'm a very conservative reader. I was growing up. Um, I did not branch out to new authors without a strong recommendation from someone whose opinion I trusted. Um, so I haven't really read broadly um, in terms of a wide variety of authors, but I've read deeply in the authors that I really like, uh, which I think is in line with some of what you guys have been saying. Um, and I think that the Internet uh, and digital communities really offer fantastic uh opportunities for people to broaden the um, their sources of reliable recommendations from other people, from um, people who have complex and, and uh, interesting and challenging uh, differences and similarities. Oh, I just want to uh, add, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of reading a book and really not liking it very much, 
and then reading the same book later and discovering it's really a great book and you just weren't up to it. That definitely has happened to me. It happened to me with Moby Dick. Okay, I, I read it as a sophomore in college. I thought, what is this thing? Okay, I cannot get through it without a, 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 a plow. Okay, and and then I read it four years later, and I was amazed how much better Mel, uh, he had gotten in the, in the four years uh, since I had last read it. Let me close it out then. Um. Well, thank you very much all for being here and, and helping us out on our first remote Bain Free Radio Hour podcast, Mark L. Van Name, John Kessel, Gray Reinhardt, Jim Menz, and uh, Christopher Schifani. Thank you. Thank you all. Now we have an excellent cut from Truth, Lies, and Make Believe, an album by Gray Reinhardt. Yep, that's the same Gray Reinhardt who was just with us for the future of the book discussion. This cut and Gray's entire new album is available at Bandcamp, Amazon, and at Gray's website, graymanwrites.com. That's a G-R-A-Y-M-A-N-W-R-I-T-E-S dot com. So here's Gray Reinhardt with, I think I'll run for Congress. <laughs> I think I'll run for Congress, cause I got some bills to pay. I book myself a pay raise on the very first day. I give jobs to all my buddies and even my family. I don't know how much they'll bribe me, I just have to wait and see. Politics, that's the life for me. Fits my arrogant, megalomaniacal personality. I get my name in the papers and my face on your TV I Take good care of myself, my friends and my family Yes, that's the life for me well, I'd like to be called honorable, but I'm really not that good I do lots of things I shouldn't do, and not the ones I should I'm not a good role model, and I burned a lot of bridges I'm probably unelectable, because I tell it like it is but politics, yeah, that's the life for me It fits my arrogant, megalomaniacal personality I get my name in the papers and my face on your TV I take good care of myself, my friends and my family Yes, that's the life for me Well, I won't make you any promises And I'll only tell you lies If I think I can get away with it Or call it a surprise Kissing babies at campaign stops Kissing interns in the halls Looking out for any scandals So I can get involved Because politics, oh, that's the life for me If it's my arrogant, megalomaniacal personality I get my name in the papers and my face on your TV Take good care of myself, my friends and my family Oh, that's the life for me I'd like to run for Congress and play the political game But I don't have very much money to wage a big campaign I'm okay with giving speeches and debating might be fun If I took myself more seriously, then I might really run Politics, that's the life for me It fits my arrogant, megalomaniacal personality I give you my name in the papers and my face on your TV. And take good care of myself, my friends, and my family. Yeah, that's the life for me. But I think I'll run for Congress, and even if I lose, I'll use my lack of knowledge to be a pundit on the news. Or maybe land a teaching gig at some university if they can mix their political science with my engineering degree. Cause playing politics, yeah, that's the life for me If it's my arrogant, megalomaniacal personality I'll get my name in the papers and my face in your TV I'll Take good care of myself, my friends and my family Yes, that's the life for me Oh, won't you vote for me?
And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering low-level conflict with the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and at the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge. Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid. In the Cherubim system, the brother and sister team of Indy and Max Graham have organized a liberation movement to oppose Cherubim's own brand of OFS corruption and oppression. They too have been contacted by covert agents promising them modern weapons and much more. At a meeting with their off-world contact, they're urged to accelerate their plan. The problem is, that contact is not at all who he seems to be, and he may be leading Indy and Max toward their deaths if they don't discover the subterfuge in time. Here's part 44 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Hmm. Harahap frowned down into his water glass for several seconds before he looked back up. Okay. Cards on the table time. I don't have complete information myself. I'm sure you both understand why that's the case. But what I've been told is that the current strategic position is very favorable for our side. The problem is that, like I just said, things can change, sometimes quickly. From what they're telling me, I'm guessing, and it's only a guess, not the kind of thing anyone would be confirming to someone at my level— that the Admiralty is thinking in terms of going on to the offensive now that they've kicked the Solis' butts in Manticore. The reason I say that is that they want to accelerate all of the liberation movements we've been supporting. Not just you guys, all of them. Now, for some of them, that would be nothing short of outright suicide at this point. And in their cases, I'm recommending that they don't do anything of the sort. I'm not sure my bosses would be delighted to hear about that. He smiled tightly. On the other hand, my bosses aren't out here, and I am. And frankly, I don't see where sending someone off half-cocked and getting them wiped out before we can get them any support is going to help anybody very much. He shrugged and took a sip of water, giving them time to absorb the fact that Nice Guy Firebrand was looking out for them. At the same time, though, he continued, lowering the glass again, I can see where raising all the hell we possibly can in the Solly's backyard would work to everyone's advantage. Especially if I'm right, and the Admiralty is planning on kicking in the League's front door. In fact... He paused, obviously considering what he was about to say, then shrugged. Beowulf didn't let the Solly's through the Beowulf terminus to support the attack on the home system, he said softly. Instead, they've signed on with us. He smiled thinly. That means we've got a protected avenue directly into the heart of the core worlds. I think the Admiralty's planning on using it, too. But when they do, they want the Sollies looking over their shoulder. Given what's already happened to Battlefleet, the League is probably going to have to call in Frontier Fleet units to reinforce closer to home. What I think my bosses have in mind is to make such a ruckus out here in the verge that OFS won't turn loose a damned thing without kicking and screaming the whole way. Beowulf sided with the Star Empire? Indiana asked, half incredulously. His knowledge of astrography outside a twenty or thirty light-year radius of Seraphim wasn't exactly profound, but he knew Beowulf was no more than a T-week or so from the Sol system itself for a ship with a military-grade hypergenerator and particle screens. That's what the dispatches say, and frankly, it's the only way we could know what happened in the home system this quickly, Harahap pointed out. 
he shrugged. Only way the Home Office could have gotten a dispatch boat out here this fast would have been through the Beowulf Terminus, which suggests to me that... He shrugged again, holding up one hand, palm uppermost, and Indiana nodded slowly. So just how soon would your bosses like us to start raising a ruckus here in Seraphim, Firebrand? Mackenzie asked, her eyes narrow. As soon as you feel you possibly could, Harahab replied. Hopefully within the next three tea months or so. Ninety tea days, in other words, she said flatly. Yes, he said. And you can get us naval support in that time frame? Yes, he replied. How? Her tone was a bit skeptical. I'm as excited about the possibility as Indy is, Firebrand. But if your navy is going to be going directly after Saul, how is any of it supposed to make its way all the way out here? It's not. He shook his head. What's going to happen is that Admiral Goldpeak is about to launch an offensive out of the Talbot Cluster in the next month or so. He met Mackenzie's eyes levelly, confident in his ability to lie convincingly. Her main objective is going to be the Madras sector. He continued, blithely ignoring the fact that Gold Peak almost certainly wasn't going to do anything of the sort. That's going to require most of her heavy units, but it should leave plenty of cruisers and destroyers available for other duties, let's say. Like turning up here in Seraphim to provide you with some orbital support. And to make sure Frontier Fleet doesn't provide any orbital support to MacReady and O'Sullivan. Mackenzie looked at him for several moments before, finally, she nodded slowly. It actually made sense, she thought. Assuming Gold Peak managed to meet the schedule Harahap had described, and assuming there was some way to coordinate properly. Do you need an answer tonight? she asked. To be honest, I'd prefer one as soon as possible, Harahap said, and this time he was telling the truth. On the other hand, I know this came at you completely cold, and the last thing either of us needs is for you to rush into something that's just going to get you all killed without accomplishing anything for us. I'll be on planet for another couple of days, so you've got that long to think about it, but then I'm going to have to move on to my next destination. I don't know if we can have a decision for you that quickly, Indiana put in. He looked across the table at his sister, then back at Harahap. We'd be putting a lot of people at risk, and we're going to have to go back and evaluate the assumptions of our contingency plans. I can understand that, but if I head out of the Seraphim system, I take your communications link with me. He grimaced. Once I'm out of here, I won't be able to communicate with Admiral Goldpeak to warn her you're planning to move. We might be able to work around that, Mackenzie said slowly, and Harahap's eyebrows rose. He hadn't expected to hear that. How? he asked. He'd hoped giving them a two-day window would push them into making a decision, and he was none too delighted by the suggestion that there was a factor in the equation that he hadn't known about. Mendoza of Cordoba imports beef from Montana, Mackenzie said. They make regular trips, and they maintain an irregular schedule of dispatch boats between here and Myers. About half the time, the boat stops off in Montana to check on market conditions, see about renegotiating contracts if the market price has changed, that sort of thing. She shrugged. We've got contacts in the crews of some of the freighters on the Montana run. For that matter, we've got contacts on at least two of the dispatch boat crews. It's about 28 T days from here to Montana by dispatch boat, more like 6 T weeks for one of the high-speed freighters. If we can use the dispatch boat, we could get a message to Myers in a couple of T months. If we have to use the freighter and arrange a message relay from Montana... We might be looking at as much as 40 months, maybe even longer. I didn't know about that, Harahap admitted truthfully. And I wish you didn't know about it either.
he added silently. On the other hand, as far as I know, Gold Peak isn't going anywhere near Myers without direct orders from home. So, worst case scenario, you get a message to Montana in two months. Hmm. He thought about it. The odds were that any messenger from Seraphim would be regarded as a nutcase, if not a Solarian agent provocateur, by any Manticoran naval officer. The Mantis certainly weren't going to fall all over themselves dispatching warships into Solarian territory on some wild goose chase substantiated by nothing more than somebody who claimed his revolutionary organization had been in contact with them all along. In fact, he could probably help that reaction along just a bit. All right, he said, nodding with an expression of profound relief. Actually, I'm relieved to hear you have another means of communication. I'd still prefer to know what your plans are before I have to leave, for a lot of reasons, but I can understand why you're going to have to think about this, and at least you're not as dependent on us as I thought you'd be to communicate with Admiral Goldpeak. Is your contact arrangement such that you know now if you'd be able to send a message off? The schedules aren't cast in ceramicrete, if that's what you mean, Mackenzie said. They usually hit within, oh, a local week or so of their regular departure times, though, she shrugged. That's for the freighters, of course. The dispatch boats are on a lot more irregular schedule. But you could count on getting one off within a one-tea-month window? Oh, that we could do, Indiana assured him. All right. I'm going to give you a code phrase for Admiral Goldbeak. When she hears it, she'll know I sent you, and on that basis, she'll be prepared to dispatch an appropriate naval force to support you immediately. Actually, it would probably finish off any chance Goldpeak might believe them. Since there was no such code phrase, she'd have to take it as proof that their messenger was an imposter, but there was no point worrying them with that, he thought. With that in mind, would you be prepared to go ahead and kick off your short-range plan within, say, two T-months of having sent off your messenger? I don't know, Mackenzie said hesitantly. Without having coordinated directly with Gold Peak, without knowing support is on its way, we'd be asking our people to take an awful risk. I realize that but this is the kind of business risks have to be taken in, Harahap pointed out. And you'd be in complete control of whether or not you sent the messenger in the first place. It would be a case of your having looked at the situation here in Seraphim and decided you really can pull it off, assuming you get Admiral Goldpeak's naval support before anybody from OFS or Frontier Fleet could respond to MacReady. If you aren't satisfied, you can do that. Then you never send your messenger off in the first place. Indiana was nodding thoughtfully, and Mackenzie looked at her brother with a worried expression. He saw it and smiled at her. I'm not going to rush off into anything without your support, Max, he reassured her. But Firebrand has a point. We'd be the ones calling the shots. Could we do that and then wait until Admiral Goldpeak actually gets here? Mackenzie asked. I suppose. Harahap injected a doubtful note into his tone, and both Grams looked at him. He shrugged. Look, I understand your concerns, but the Star Empire's up against it too, you know. We've supported you this far, as the weapon shipments you've already received indicate. We'd like to support you further, and as I explained to you the first time we met, it wouldn't be in our interest to encourage people to revolt and then stand back and watch them get the chop. All of that's true, but I also have to say that we've got to allocate our resources carefully. Not things like weapon shipments. Those we can arrange basically whenever and wherever we need to. But we're talking about warships, about naval support... And we're up against the Solarian League, the biggest navy in the history of the galaxy. If you can't commit to a specific date for your own organization to strike, 
until you've actually got Manticoran warships in orbit around the planet, you're probably going to get pushed further down the priorities queue. I'm not trying to make any kind of threat here, or give you any kind of ultimatum. I'm just saying that if Admiral Goldpeak is looking at requests for support, she's probably going to give priority to the people running the greatest risks. And if she's strapped for light units, she's probably not going to give very much priority to somebody who tells her they can't take action until they have Manticoran units actually in their skies. She'll figure that if you're waiting for that kind of response, you won't be coming into the open until you get it. And if you're not out in the open, you're probably not going to take any heavy hits from the Skags, so she can afford to let you wait while she deals with more pressing commitments. You're saying she'd refuse to send us support? Indiana asked. No. I'm saying there'd be a good chance she'd move you down the list. Harahap shrugged. She'd probably send word back by your contact, telling you how soon she'd be able to free up units to send in your direction. It might not be very long. On the other hand, given how other operations go, it could be you'd be looking at your original two- or three-t-year time frame. More probably, it would fall somewhere in the middle. The Grams looked at each other again. Indiana raised one eyebrow, and Mackenzie shrugged. Then he turned back to Harahap. We understand what you're saying. We understand the logic behind it, too. And the truth is, as I'm sure you realized before you said it, that there's no way we want to leave our dad, or anyone else, rotting in Terabor prison one minute longer than we have to. We'll look at our options and at our communications channels and see what we can do. I don't think there's any way we could possibly give you an answer before you have to leave the system, but we will make our minds up as quickly as possible. That's all I can ask for. Harahap smiled. Like I say, no one wants you running stupid risks, so look at those options carefully. But if you do decide to move... Admiral Goldpeak will be there for you. Good. Indiana looked as if he wanted to say more, but at that moment Electa reappeared, carrying a tray laden with steaming bowls. She set it down and began distributing food, and Harahap settled back, sniffing appreciatively. The curry smelled just as good as she'd promised, and he allowed himself to look forward to it. He wasn't completely satisfied with the evening's work, and his bosses wouldn't be either. Fortunately, they were professionals who understood timing was always a problem in an operation like this one, and no one could ever predict how it would work out in the end, not really. There was always some damned unknown factor waiting around to screw things up, like that idiot Zagorski in Loomis. An entire tea year of preparations and quiet contacts right down the tubes because of him and Macquarie, and the fumblers hadn't even turned up evidence that Manticore had been involved with the LLL. Talk about wasted effort. As a general rule, incompetent opponents were a blessing, but when they were too friggin' stupid to do their own jobs just when you actually needed them to... He brushed that thought aside. Done was done, and Loomis hadn't been his op anyway. This one was and he was a craftsman who took pride in his work. So did those superiors of his, who weren't going to be happy if he couldn't talk these kids into accelerating their schedule. He didn't know exactly why that was, and those superiors weren't about to tell him, but that was fine. He understood the rules, even if they could turn around and bite someone on the ass too often for comfort, and he'd do his best to pull it off. It was obvious he wasn't going to rush these two after all, though. Indiana was clearly more inclined to act quickly, yet it was equally clear he wasn't prepared to overrule Mackenzie's more cautious, analytical approach. His employers were just going to have to settle for the best he could do, and at least they were far more pragmatic and aware of operational realities and limitations than some of the people he'd worked for in the past. As long as he was honest in his reports to them, they were unlikely to send him a pulsar dart just because he hadn't been able to accomplish the impossible. 
Arahap considered the odds as he began ladling curry over a plate of rice. Fifty-fifty, he decided. Maybe as high as sixty-forty, his favor, given Indiana's aggressiveness, but not any better than that. Still, he'd won a lot of bets at worse odds than that, and if this one didn't work out, all he and his employers lost was the time and the piddling expense of the weapons they'd provided. Whereas, if it did work... I can live with fifty-fifty, he decided. After all, it won't be my ass whichever side crops out. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 44, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, Laura Haywood Corey, Christopher Cifani, our remote podcast audience, and the great folks at Illogicon 3 in Raleigh-Durham. And, of course, podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Plus an encomium of the virtualized cheers of satisfied millions, drone delivered through tornado, fire, and ice, to Mark L. Van Name, John Kessel, Gray Reinhardt, and Jim Menz. And to books everywhere, whatever you little boogers may become in the future. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars, 